Greetings and welcome to Brunswick Street Baptist Church today as we gather to worship the Lord Jesus. We're so pleased that you've come to share with us virtually in this online service and to be part of our family today and we pray that you'll feel very much uh, that way. In our service today, we'll be hearing from Jessica Savard, a respiratory therapist, member of our congregation who is working in Cape Breton, and uh, have the added bonus of her brother, Deacon Adam Savard, leading us in prayer. So you can look forward to that as the service unfolds. We're grateful to all who are leading us today and who lead us each week in this online version of uh, our Sunday worship time. In just a moment, Patrick and Meredith Curry are going to uh, lead us in a call to worship that will take us into uh, worship and song time, and we hope that you will join in that. Thank you so much for being here today, and in our midst, may Jesus Christ be glorified. Shout praises to the Lord. Our God is kind, and it is right and good to sing praises to him. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem and brings the people of Israel back home again. Our Lord is great and powerful. He understands everything. Jesus Christ never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our sacrifice is to keep offering praise to God in the name of Jesus. Boys and girls, thanks for joining us today. Have you ever been at the doctor's office getting a checkup? You're sitting on the table and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the doctor takes a little hammer, bumps you on the knee. And what happens? Your reflexes make your legs shoot up. It's called a knee jerk reaction. Anyway, that's, that's your reaction to your knee getting hit with a hammer. If you're outside playing ball, hopefully not inside, a ball is coming towards your face. What do you do? Your reaction is to either block it or duck out of the way. Otherwise, you might have to go back and see that doctor who hits you on the knee with a hammer. There's a verse in the New Testament in the book of First Thessalonians, which was um, written by Paul, and he was writing a letter to the early church to encourage them. And the verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 reads, Give thanks whatever happens. This is what God wants for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks whatever happens. What this verse is saying is that what our reaction should be is that of thanks. Over the past few months, we've spent a lot of time at home. And I will tell you, 
that my reactions to everything that is coming at me is not always that of giving thanks. Sometimes I'm worried. Sometimes I'm frustrated. Sometimes I complain. Maybe you do too. Maybe your parents do too. This verse is really encouraging us to change, to have an attitude of gratitude and to look at things and give thanks to God through whatever is happening. And I really do try to have an attitude of gratitude. I'm really trying to give thanks. There's something specifically that I've been thankful for a lot lately is the beautiful weather that we're having. Um, it would be a very difficult time to be home if you couldn't get outside. Um, I'm thankful that we have safe spaces to play outside um, and I'm thankful for lots of fresh air. I'm also really thankful for the Premier and the Chief Medical Officer and all the people that are in charge of making really important decisions for, for us as a province. I'm thankful for our church leadership who have been faithful in coming up with really creative ideas to keep our church family together in this time of being apart. I'm thankful for so much in this season and I will tell you that if I focus on my thing that my the blessings that I have the things that I'm thankful for the more I focus on those and all the good things that God is doing in our lives during this season and in every season the less inclined I am to be worried to be frustrated and to complain because it's hard to complain when you're focused on your blessings. So I would challenge you this week, and even challenge your parents too, to really look at how you can give thanks whatever happens. Will you join with me in prayer? We're gonna blast off. Eyes closed, heart open. Father God, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for the leadership that we have at this time. Thank you for the beautiful weather that we have. Thank you that we can still get together as a church family, even though we are apart. Thank you for giving us your son, the greatest gift of all. Father, as we go about this next week, I pray that you will help us to focus on all the things that you are blessing us with and that we will give thanks to you for all you have done and all you are continuing to do for us. I pray that you will help us to be more thankful and less worried and less anxious, less frustrated and more focused on you. We ask these things in your name, amen. I hope you have a great week and remember to practice an attitude of gratitude. Let that be your reaction. Acts 15, 13 to 35. After they had finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. Fallen from its ruins, I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all peoples may seek the Lord. Even the Gentiles, over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who had been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain not only from things polluted by idols, but from fornication and from whatever has been strangled, and from blood. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. And then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the believers of the Gentile origin in Antioch, Syria, 
and Cecilia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us through no instructions from us have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch. And when they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When its members read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After they had been there for some time, they were sent off in peace by the believers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, and there, with many, many others, they taught and proclaimed the word of the Lord. Hey, thanks for tuning in again this week, folks, as we continue our study of Acts 15. And you recall from last time that we were in the middle of an emergency meeting that was called because of a crisis. It all started with a group, and yes, they were a minority faction, but they were vocal and they were aggressive, and this group traveled some 300 miles north from Jerusalem and arrived at the church in Antioch, telling the new believers that unless you adhere to the customs of Moses, you can't be saved. And we were puzzled by that insistence because it cuts against the grain of all that we've learned so far in the first half of the book of Acts. I mean, consider as one example, Cornelius the Roman, whose biography is recorded way back in chapter 10. Through a series of divine appointments, this Gentile hears from an utterly reliable source that new life comes through Jesus, that all the prophets testify about him, and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And moments later, the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 10 arrived on every Gentile in the house of Cornelius who heard those words. But then, as we studied last week, at the beginning of chapter 15, this anonymous faction showed up at Antioch declaring, in effect, that Cornelius and anyone like him can't be saved because he hasn't adhered to the customs of Moses. Last week, we called this group the Renegade Rigorists. This week, let's call them the Supplement Kings, because they are asserting that the cross is not enough. Now, fortunately, we weren't the only ones bewildered by this claim, for we also saw Paul and Barnabas in sharp disagreement and strenuously debating with the Supplement Kings. And matters must have come to something of an impasse in Antioch because a council meeting was summoned in Jerusalem and as we recall, it was a tense affair. Both parties agreed that the scriptures matter and that the law was given to Israel and is now extended to Christian Gentile as, as well. But the critical question in the first instance can be framed as follows. Is salvation a gift or is it an achievement? And does the Holy Spirit have the power to enable and to transform our lives as disciples of Jesus? Well, during the meeting, there was a bit of a deadlock. Some were belonging to the party of the Pharisees, stridently maintaining that Mosaic rules are non-negotiable for believers. Then, and this was the big money last week in our study, the Apostle Peter was the one who broke the stalemate by standing up and taking the floor. Whether that speech was expected or extemporaneous, regardless, it was one for the ages. And he looked his combatants in the eye and he said this, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, 
Why do you try to test God by slamming on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither, neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Now, even more than those lines about the stunning impartiality of God's faithfulness, this speech is impressive because of who is speaking. For Peter knows firsthand what it means to be forgiven and to be restored. The very one who rescued him from the waters of chaos when he was drowning is the same one who then justifies him. That is, makes him right with God through faith. So when Peter speaks, it's not abstract, it's not theoretical, it's been lived and it has been experienced. In the context of this meeting in Jerusalem, it was important that Peter had some backup from high-ranking allies. Now, we skimmed a bit last time over this line, but listen again to verse 12, because it provides an important angle for us as we enter into our study this week. Acts 15, 12, the whole assembly became silent after Peter's speech, as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and the wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. So Paul and Barnabas also provide their side of the story and surely enhance and underscore what Peter has just said. And probably for the first time in a very long time, Paul really doesn't say that much. He tells some stories about what happened when the Gentiles come to faith, reports about transformed lives and how they discover the scriptures in many cases for the first time. But he wisely leaves the keynote speeches to others. And strategically, this was probably a judicious move since a lot of the hardliners at the council were suspicious and thought that he was part of the problem. Not only was it a smart tactic, but as we just heard, it also moves the meeting toward a, a resolution because after they'd finished speaking, a new speaker of high stature moved to the podium. There's a lot going on in the speech of James that was just read for us in verses 31, 13 to 21, but, but start by considering the speaker for a moment. And for all of you note takers in the gym, remember when there was a gym with note takers? Here are four points about James that you may want to keep in mind as we listen to his words here in Acts 15. First, as we look back on the life of James, for a long time, he did not understand the real purpose of the Messiah. He's got a great name. I mean, James is the Greek form of Jacob, and he's the brother of Jesus. Okay, the half-brother, just before you lawyer up. But, you know, despite such proximity, it, it doesn't appear that early on he was a dedicated follower at all. In fact, every text in the Gospels that mentions James and the other half-brothers always pictures them at something of a distance without a real intimacy that we might expect. Moreover, there's a famous passage in Luke uh, chapter eight that occasions a fairly sharp comment from Jesus. Listen to Luke eight nineteen and following, because then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they couldn't reach him on account of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, Jesus did, and said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So you can be really close to Jesus, but not understand the real purpose of the Messiah. Second, though, something changed. Something changed and James became an apostle. How'd that happen? How on earth did James move from seeing God at work and doing things to actually being a part of it all? How did he move from being an outsider to being an apostle, point number two. Well, you have to listen close, but in 1 Corinthians, first, uh, first Corinthians first 15, rather, Paul gives details about the apostolic lineup. And there's every evidence that an incredible event took place that profoundly affected James's future. Here's what Paul writes in a famous passage. I think we heard it at Easter, but, but pay real attention here, because Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 15, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then, then he appeared to James. 
Then to all the apostles, and last of all, Paul writes, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Did you catch that? James is granted the privilege of a post-resurrection appearance of the risen Lord Jesus. And on that basis, there are grounds for suggesting that James has a conversion experience, perhaps akin to Paul on the road to Damascus. And James moves from the distance to the very center of belief. And we're quite right to suppose that an encounter with the risen Savior will have that effect. Third, James doesn't just move from the margins after that post-resurrection experience, but he becomes a pillar of the church. We can infer from the circumstance that James takes over from Peter as the principal leader of the Jerusalem church. Our first inkling of this development is during Herod's persecution. You recall in chapter 12, after Peter's nocturnal prison break, he quickly goes to the house of John Mark's mother, and since he's about to go off the grid for the foreseeable future, Peter tells the assembled church to tell James all that's happened. That would explain his prominence here at the council meeting in chapter 15, and why James speaks with an ample measure of authority and subsequently renders a judgment on the proceedings. When Paul writes to the Galatians, he not only mentions James, but refers to him as one of the pillars of the church. If you think of the magnificent Jerusalem temple, the pillars were taken so seriously in the ancient times that they were actually given names, and the very image of a pillar speaks to strength and stability, something load-bearing and immovable, even in the midst of storms and chaos. A pillar of the church, therefore, is someone who stands firm, rooted in the faith, like that tree planted by streams of living water in Psalm 1, and is not swayed, even in the midst of turbulence and times of confusion. And for James, that's quite a journey from the fringes to now a pillar of reliable leadership during unprecedented times in first century Jerusalem. Fourth, later in his career, James becomes a letter writer, and his letter is preserved for us and became, in time, the 59th book of the Bible. Now, if you look at the book of James, you'll see that it's addressed to the 12 tribes who were dispersed or scattered among the nations. In other words, like those early believers who had to leave Jerusalem because of the outbreak of persecution, and yet who took the gospel wherever they ended up away from home. They took the gospel with them. And this letter of James is dripping with insight for how to live well amidst difficulties and setbacks and adversities, as well as practical advice for how to live among the Gentiles in a faithful and an attractive way. That's probably why the letter starts with uh, an off-sighted passage Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You know, I rarely do that. I rarely consider it pure joy. Usually I consider trials to be pure aggravation or inconvenience or a right pain in the esophagus. You know, that's why I need wisdom and that's why I'm glad that wisdom is a huge theme in the book of James. And you can imagine that inspired words like those I quoted and later words about wisdom in chapter three are drawn from his own sojourn and a wealth of accumulated life experience. Not only is the journey of James himself reflected in the content of the letter, but you can also hear it in the content of his speech right here in Acts 15, as his own movement from the margins to committed belief and his calling as an apostle and a pillar of the faith variously can be heard in the verses 13 to 21. I mean, James has a a great deal of street cred, as they say, among those in his attendance at the council. But he also speaks wisely and at the right time in this meeting. And here's a subtle example. 
you're gonna maybe have to get a Sherlock Holmes magnifying glass for this one, but, but if you do, you will notice, look close, verse 13, that he refers to Peter as Simeon. Do you remember that being read a moment ago? Simeon. He pulls out Peter's Hebrew name, the Hebrew name on his birth certificate, and he calls him in the midst of this assembly in Acts 15, Simeon. Now don't forget that James is addressing hardliners. We appreciate that they're believers, but they're also afraid. Afraid that the story of their faith is going to get obscured and watered down by, by Gentiles. It's going to get mingled with the Greek and Roman religions of the surrounding world. Their concerns are legitimate, but they don't quite understand the real purpose of the Messiah. And James knows exactly where they're coming from, because not so long ago, that was his very own testimony. You know, sometimes just, just one word, that's all it takes to reassure those who are anxious. And in this case, that word in season is James referring to Peter as Simeon. At once, this disarms the rigorists, affirms their identity as the stock of Israel, and with that word, it draws attention to what is and what isn't the real issue at stake here in Acts 15. You see, Acts 15 is often characterized as tradition versus innovation. And usually tradition is the villain. You know, tradition versus innovation. Hillsong versus hymns, or however you want to characterize that. But that's not really what's happening in this chapter. Rather, the issue at stake is spiritual discernment and understanding how God fulfills ancient promises through the arrival of the Messiah. You know, about a year ago, a few of us from Brunswick Street signed up for a conference, and it was called Fresh Expressions. And one of the questions discussed was, given that typical Canadians aren't really inclined to just show up out of curiosity and come to church and say, hey, what's going on? How can we connect better? How can we be the church even beyond our campuses? I confess, privately, that I kind of had low expectations and but was happy to go along. But yet as I sat there in the conference with all kinds of different pe people, there was vigorous and intelligent and passionate debate about that very question and how to reach all kinds of different folks in our country. And I came away deeply impressed and mildly optimistic, and that's not my usual response to such gatherings. The church in Canada is increasingly an embattled minority, but you know, we can come together with humility and with faithful creativity, trusting in each other's gifts and callings and unique configuration of life lessons and background, and we can do that in order to reach a new generation with the clarity and with the hope of the good news. That is what's going on in Acts 15. And along those lines, it's instructive that a key word from James right at the outset is listen. How does he start this pivotal and summarizing speech, this proactive speech at the meeting in Acts 15? My friends, my dear friends, he says, listen. Hey, did you know that the Hebrew word for listen or hear, it's the exact same word as obey. So hear and obey is the same word in Hebrew. It occurs hundreds of times. And if you take that and apply it to the context of James's speech here in Acts 15, the word listen signals a frame of mind that's open to receiving instruction and implementing repentance. It's an awareness that we all need special revelation. We need God's word in order to truly live our lives with a faithful adventurousness. For all of us, a word like this is an invitation to consider our posture before scripture. See, we don't just read the Bible. The Bible reads us, and we have to listen to what the Holy Spirit says to each of us through the power of the written word. Speaking of which, the centerpiece of James's eloquent speech is a prophetic quotation from the book of Amos, and several other prophetic writings are mingled in there, and it's a passage that speaks to God, envisioning a day that David's fallen tent, did you hear that a moment ago when the passage was read? David's fallen tent, a tent that was too small and not nearly big enough to accommodate the divine plan for humanity. David's fallen tent will be rebuilt and it's gonna be spacious enough 
to include all the interested Gentiles in a radically new kind of community. And this is why James recommends that Gentile believers abstain from four kinds of practices that we just heard in our reading of this passage a few minutes ago. There's been ample debate, trust me, about why these particular four issues are highlighted, but I don't think it's that complicated. The principal word here is idols. You see, those four practices that were enumerated, each of them is associated in a different way with Greek and Roman and pagan temple rituals. So, the new believers need to discover that the Christian community is a group that comes together and offers an alternative to the idols of this fallen world. Oh, nowadays we might be tempted to think, look, there's no pagan temples to Zeus or Aphrodite. If you go to Regent Park Mall, I don't see any there, so there's no problem. Well, not so fast. One astute commentator puts it this way. In today's culture, believers no longer contend for Christ in a world dominated by pagan shrines or temples. Nonetheless, the polluting effect of idolatry continues as witnessed in the unprincipled acquisition of wealth or in triumphal nationalism. And temples to these idols are in fact found in our city's marketplaces and town squares. Whatever holds primary values in place of God is an idol and related institutions function as its temples. So James's remarks on purity represent a discipleship that's ever alert to those competing interests that sully our daily walk with the Lord and our neighbors. Through Jesus, we discover that God's law is in some monolithic cosmic accounting mechanism that we have to robotically conform to or else. That's a deficient view of God and an emaciated way of looking at God's word. The law, rather, is a gift that enables human flourishing, enabling us to achieve what we were created for and through the power of the Holy Spirit bestowed on us through the risen Savior, we've got an entirely new opportunity to activate God's word in our lives. Thus, it's eminently wise to steer clear of idolatrous distractions and entanglements, and that's what James is formally advising here in Acts 15. And indeed, his recommendation at the meeting passes. And it's seemingly unanimous because we don't hear from the hardliners again in this chapter. Instead, what we have is a trustworthy delegation commissioned to deliver a letter that includes James's wise advice, and the letter is subsequently delivered to Antioch, as we heard, and it's received with joy. And so that means that we finally reached the end of the very long meeting of Acts 15. And we may well ask in closing, what, what have we learned? What's a quick takeaway? You know, in many ways, this chapter is about how we relate to one another, and what kind of community we can become. I mean, if you ask the average Canadian, hey, what's your perception of the church? I'm not talking particular churches, I'm, I'm just talking in general, your average Canadian hockey night in Canada watcher. How many are going to say this? Well, you know, I, I think it's a handful of out of touch people who sit there trying to keep some rules or, or something like that. Well, if that's the case and that's a dominant answer that we hear, it's probably true that we've fallen short. And that's why it's great that Acts 15 gives a more attractive vision of our community. One allied against the idolatries of this fallen world and one that invites everyone to learn how to live a life under God's saving grace. And here's my final point. You see, the chapter started off with an internal confrontation, but the conflict is resolved through wisdom, through hearing scripture, through mutual respect. And what's the result? Well, for that, we're going to have to pick it up next time. But when we do, here's what we're going to notice. We are on the threshold in the second half of the book of Acts, and the gospel is poised to enter vast new territory with outreach and with effectiveness, because that's what happened when we're immersed in Scripture and we're led by the energizing power of the Holy Spirit.
Hey Brunswick Street family, it's been a long time since I've seen all of your smiling faces. Um, my name is Jessica, I'm a respiratory therapist and a frontline worker. Um, I used to go to Brunswick Street, I grew up in the church and about two years ago I moved to Cape Breton to work at the hospital. Moved here with my cat who was in the corner and insisted on being in the video. Um, so I was just asked to share a little bit about my experience with the front line and um, just some prayer requests, some things for you all to keep in your prayers. Um, just give us that support on the front line. So I'm a respiratory therapist and that's probably not a term that a lot of people are familiar with. We're kind of one of the unknown specialties in the hospital. So I am an acute care specialist who, um, my big, my big thing is airway management. So any kind of breathing emergency or airway disease or anything like that, that's the kind of patient that I would see. I manage the ventilator or the life support machine. Ventilator has been coming up a lot in the news lately. Um, that's my big thing and what I take care of. It's the machine that helps you breathe when you really can't. Um, so you can imagine that during a respiratory pandemic, we're a little, we're a little bit stressed. Um, and that's a lot of what the front line looks like right now. There's a lot of stress and uncertainty and some fear um, on the front line. And it's not just for healthcare workers, it's for truck drivers, the grocery store workers, anyone who is an essential employee, I think is probably facing the same thing. So there's a whole lot of uncertainty. We've had so many changes to our therapies in the past few months. Um, so because of this, we go into a lot of unknown situations. I'm used to emergency situations where I can make snap decisions and know immediately what course of action I should take, what would benefit that patient. Um, right now we've kind of had to slow down and change our thinking to, okay, how can we get this patient the best therapy, but also keep from spreading the virus and keep ourselves safe? So you can, that's, it's pretty stressful going into a situation where you know what could work right away, but you kind of have to hold back. Um, there's a lot of fear from the staff and the public as well. Um, fear of the unknown. The public understandably are afraid. If they know that you're in healthcare, you're likely to get a text or a call um, or just questions from people asking, what's the hospital look like right now? Like, who's in the hospital? How many COVID patients are in the hospital? And those are all questions that we're unable to answer. Um, we don't really like not being able to answer questions. We're helpers. We like to be able to alleviate those fears. And there's really nothing that we can do for that right now. Um, but there's also been some good things come out of it. We've seen a lot of staff bonding. We've kind of all come together in the middle of this and we've put our differences aside and things like that. And there's been a lot of teamwork. Um, the public has been great. Everybody's been really supportive in practical ways and through prayer as well. 
Um, they're be really becoming aware of how important frontline workers are, the food industry, groceries, healthcare workers. Um, so it's really, really great to see. Um, as far as things that you can pray for, um, peace would be a big one. Uh, I know a lot of frontline workers are struggling with loneliness. We've been kind of isolated from families and from friends. Um, quite a few people that I work with have actually isolated themselves completely from their families. They're living either in a cottage or a trailer. They haven't seen their families in weeks. Patience for staff in the public is a big thing. We're all kind of nearing our boiling point. We're getting tired of the um, government's regulations and things like that, but patience for all of us would be huge. And the continued health of the staff and the public. We're already short staff as it is. The respiratory department only has 25 staff members. So you can imagine if one of us gets sick, it affects a lot of us. Um, health of the public is huge as well. Keep it, keep this virus contained and from spreading and just pray for all of our maritime provinces. Um, thank you for your continued prayer support. I've talked for too long now. Um, your prayers are working. Thank you so much, and I can't wait to get home and see you all. Bye. Let's pray. God, thank you for everything that you've given us uh, up to this point. The, the sunshine, uh, no floods, and uh, yeah, just the, the opportunity to get to know uh, our family members maybe a little bit better. Uh, God, I know that right now it's not an easy time. Um, and we're all feeling uh, the excitement at uh, possibly being able to see our friends again. Um, and yeah, just the, the drain of also not having seen them for so long. Uh, but God, I pray that uh, we would uh, continue to be vigilant, that we would lean on you for strength, uh, that we would prepare uh, for whatever comes next. Uh, and God, I know that you can beat this virus, that... Uh, uh, that you are bigger than it, uh, that you can protect us from it. So God, I pray that you would do that. Um, yeah, just thank you for all of uh, the little things that uh, that have come our way. Um, yeah, God, I thank you so much for uh, your continuing presence in our lives. And I just thank you as well for just the reminder that Jesus is Lord, even over things that seem daunting. Yeah, God, I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
once again, we pray that it's been a blessing for you today to be part of our church family. If there's a way that we can minister to you, please note the uh, email address at the end of the video and uh, let us know how we can stand with you in these days. Grateful to all who have led us today and for Dr. Bodner's uh, exploration of Acts chapter 15. Next Sunday will be the final Sunday in uh, this series as we take a break and turn to uh, a variety of summer sermons uh, over the next few weeks. As we conclude today, thinking about the Church of Jesus Christ and our mission in the world, these words from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you will have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us and may God bless you in your week of service for him.